Warning. Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat involves the discussion of horror and suspense movies. These movies often include violent, frightening, and disturbing content. Also, we sometimes discuss ladies and their lovely physical attributes, and we sometimes discuss topics considered naughty to talk about in polite company. This program is intended for audiences over the age of 18. Viewer, discretion is advised. All right, you nitwits. It is first thing Tuesday morning. This is when we normally do our weekly production meeting, but I have already heard from corporate first thing this morning, so we're going to have to talk about something else instead. You know what? It's easier if I just show you. Hang on a second. Let me get the news going. Good evening and welcome to Channel 9 News. I am your host, Randall Barkington III. Our top story, Scandal Rocks the World of Entertainment, as a leaked videotape shows the cast of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat in a raucous, drunken state at a private Halloween party. The party included costumes and stereotypes that many will find offensive. The footage that you are about to see was leaked to Channel 9 News by an anonymous source. Be warned that much of what you're about to see may be considered offensive. I fart in your general direction! Oh man, they are so wasted. This is the best moon pie I've had since Burning Man, man. Fancy just passed out face first on the buffet table. What the hell are you supposed to be anyway? I'm Harry Potter, I am. Pip Pip, and time for tea, and all that English stuff. Ten points to Gryffindor. What about you? What are you supposed to be? Hey, look at me! I'm an Italian! I eat a pasta and drive an Alfa Romeo! Mamma mia! You're wearing a sombrero. Sombreros are from Mexico, not Italy. You're in the wrong country. You're not just in the wrong country, you're in the wrong hemisphere. Mexico? Really? Well, well what are they supposed to sound like? Oh wait, I've got it! Crikey, that's a big crock! Let's open up a Foster's and throw a few shrimp on the barbie! Uh, no. Still in the wrong hemisphere. That's Australian. If, if anything, that's even farther away from Mexico than Italy. Well, hey dear, me and the fellas were gonna go down to the lake and do some ice fishing, don't you know, before the hockey game and... Oh wait, that's Minnesota? I, I thought Minnesota and Mexico were like right next door to each other. Oh, 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 I've got it! Did you see that ludicrous display last night? You see, the problem with Arsenal is they're always trying to walk it in. Yeah, you're right. That's Cockney. Even I know that one. We are monitoring this story and will bring you more updates as they happen. In the meantime, we urge the public to remain calm, avoid unfounded speculation, and avoid becoming offended. If the public were to become offended, then there could be protests, which Channel 9 would be compelled to cover live and then follow up with a roundtable discussion featuring all of our editorial contributors. The public is urged not to hold a protest outside of PBDC TV headquarters in Transylvania, Romania. The public is urged not to stage this protest at 6.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, as this would allow us to do a live hit during our nightly news broadcast. The public is urged not to have press releases ready to distribute on site at the protest to members of the press in order to assure proper attribution and correct spelling of names. The public is urged not to make themselves available this Sunday from 8.30 a.m. to noon in order to be available for live hits during our Sunday morning news program. Please remain calm. We will continue to cover this story with updates every seven minutes and a live update from Transylvania on the half hour. And now here's Johnny Mountain with today's weather. I warned you. I told you, do not throw a cast Halloween party because they are a minefield of politically correct violations. People will get upset. People will say you are appropriating their culture. People will say you are engaging in offensive stereotypes. People have no sense of humor about that sort of thing in this day and age. I told you, no RC Cola, no moon pies, no costume parties. But did you listen to me? No, you did not listen to me. Now everyone in the world is upset. 
Let me give you just a sampling of who I have heard from just this morning in addition to corporate. The Italian embassy called, they are offended. The Mexican embassy called, they are offended. The Irish embassy called, they're offended that nobody told them we were going to be making fun of the British because they wanted to join in. The Somali Pirates Association called, they're offended. The American Federation of Ice Fishermen called, they're offended. The American Cartographers Guild called, they're offended that apparently Ravina does not know that Minnesota is not next door to Mexico. The Arsenal Football Club Fan Association called to complain that Arsenal now runs an up-tempo offense and that your criticism was off base. BBC Four called to let us know that Ravina stole that whole gag from an episode of the IT crowd from 15 years ago and didn't bother to give them credit. The Chinese Embassy called because they want to know why they don't get invited to any of the cool parties. And I can handle all of that. That's not a problem. The problem is the English. Take a look at this. Folks, you let Steve the Cat go out and do a Harry Potter costume with an American accent. You know how insecure the English are about that. For crying out loud, ever since the 1990s with that American Doctor Who movie where Eric Roberts played the master, they've been terrified about the potential of Americanization of English culture. Now look what's happening. They're burning cars and playing darts left-handed, okay? Listen, if one more screw up like this and corporate is going to send somebody out here to babysit you guys permanently and there will be no more two-hour lunches, there will be no more donuts for breakfast, there will be no more live-action board games, it's going to be work, work, and more work if that happens, okay? So I need you guys to straighten up. I need you to be smarter, okay? Now let's get back to work. Hello and welcome to Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, the place where we have fun discussing horror movies. I am your host, Steve the Cat. We're nearly to the end of October, so tonight will be the last week of our month-long celebration of Halloween-themed movies. We've already talked about the legendary Michael Myers a lot this month, so tonight we're going to do two movies featuring a new horror villain from the 21st century. Also, Professor Fluffosaurus will be joining us in a few minutes for a new episode of Monster Chat, and, of course, we'll also have a vocabulary lesson and talk about some other stuff I watched this week. Tonight's show should be a lot of fun, so I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, here we go. Everyone grab your pencils and notebooks. It's time for Steve's vocabulary lesson. All right, let's get into the vocabulary lesson, Mother De La Mort's favorite part of the show. This is the part of the show where we investigate new and exotic words and phrases in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would otherwise try to ban our discussion. Word number one for this week, Dr. Huxtabling. What is Dr. Huxtabling? Well, I'm going to tell you. This is a noun that refers to the action of using surreptitious chemical assistance in the process of abducting, incapacitating, or abusing a character. This term is derived from the name of a beloved TV character who turned out to be not at all lovable, but who cannot sue me because I did not use his real name. Word number two, double bagging. This is a noun that refers to the action of using a plastic bag to asphyxiate or attempt to asphyxiate another character. And as a note, despite the slang connotations associated with the term double bagging, the character in question does not have to be ugly. Last word for this vocabulary lesson, long division. 
This refers to the process of dividing a character into two symmetrical halves along its long axis. Colloquial forms of this term include going half seas, great dividing, and Dutch treating. Now, it's important to understand the distinction here. When you go to a magic show and you see the magician put the lady in the box and saw her in half and you know wheel the legs one way and wheel the torso the other way, that is not long division because he is slicing her along the transverse axis. Uh, long division, an example of that, think of the remake of 13 Ghosts with Tony Shalhoub where uh, one character is walking through a doorway and the glass sliding door suddenly slams shut before he makes it through and half of him falls forward and half of him falls backward, two halves on opposite sides of the glass, two symmetrical halves. That is long division. Anyway, please keep these terms in mind, they will come up later in the episode. Before we get to our featured film review, Please enjoy this episode of Monster Chat, hosted by Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Hello, and welcome to Monster Chat. I am your host, Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Today we will talk about clowns. Of all the monsters that haunt our universe, none are more terrifying than clowns. Simply stated, clowns are a physical incarnation of the nightmare realm. All intelligent creatures possess an inherent fear of clowns, and with good reason. Before any discussion of clowns begins, it is important to clarify a common misconception. From time to time you may hear some monsterology scholars refer to the concept of evil clowns. This is not correct. There is no such thing as an evil clown, as the existence of an evil clown implies the existence of good clowns. This is, of course, ridiculous. All clowns are evil. The phrase evil clown is a redundancy, much like saying feline cat, or insect bee. The history of clowns can be traced back to the Mesolithic era and a caveman named Grog Wilkinson. Grog was a normal caveman who lived in harmony with the other neighbors in his tribe. However, Grog had a terrible secret. Late at night when none of the other cavemen were watching, Grog would steal away to the woods carrying three rocks. He then would spend hours obsessively juggling the three rocks. Sometimes he would even dance and make humorous noises while juggling in an effort to amuse himself. This behavior went on for several years, until one evening when the rest of the tribe stumbled upon Grog and became aware of his terrible secret. Terrified by Grog's ability to hold three rocks using only two hands, the rest of the tribe assumed that Grog was a demon and banished him from the tribe. Before banishing him the tribe painted Grog's face as a warning to other tribes, thus condemning him to a life of solitude. Grog undertook a nomadic existence, traveling the plains with a herd of woolly mammoths. After a time Grog was joined by outcasts from other tribes, whom he instructed in the art of juggling. Grog and his compatriots thus established history's first traveling circus. Over time Grog and his compatriots founded the Wilkinson Institute for Clown Arts, a shadowy institution that exists in secret to this day. Their Wilkinson Institute instructs its students in the arts of clownism, dark wizardry, and modern dance, then strategically places them in positions of power throughout the world. Many of history's greatest monsters have secretly been clowns. If you are ever confronted by a clown I wish you good luck, as there is not much you can do about it. Clowns are shameless creatures and therefore are immune to traditional wards such as burning sage or timeshare vacation home presentations. Your best defense is to run away and hope that the clown trips over its large squeaky shoes. This has been Monster Chat with Professor Edgar. Fluffosaurus. Thank you for joining me. And now it's time for our featured film reviews. So our first featured film for today is All Hallows Eve. And there you see the poster. Creepy, creepy poster with a close-up of Art the Clown's face. This is a slasher anthology 
that was released in the year 2013. It was directed by Damien Leone, and the cast includes Katie McGuire, Catherine Callahan, Marie Mazur, Kayla Leanne, and Mike Gianelli as Art the Clown. So let's talk about setting your expectations for this movie. As we know, setting expectations is important in setting yourself up for enjoying or not enjoying a movie. So let's start you off with what to expect. You should expect a creepy slasher anthology with an old school 1980s feel. Why you should watch is this is an iconic cult fan favorite that every horror fan should see at least once. Now, that does not guarantee that you're gonna like the movie but it is one of those kind of staples of a horror fan's diet that you need to at least try once. And odds are you're going to like this movie. Not everyone's going to like it, um, but it is a cult favorite, and uh, most people who are horror fans do tend to like this one. You might like this movie if you like Tales of Halloween, Trick or Treat, and I throw Saw in the list. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, this is not similar to Saw in terms of story matter, but it is similar to Saw a bit in terms of the atmosphere. We'll talk about that more in a minute. As far as setting your expectations, be advised that there is absolutely no humor in this film. The atmosphere is very dark, it's very creepy, and it has a tinge of what I would say is filth and disgust. Now, I'm not saying that it's a filthy, disgusting movie. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I'm saying it kind of has a a visual, the, the word I keep using is a visual aroma uh, that you would associate like with an old, uh, old abandoned factory or an old gas station bathroom. It just, it just kind of makes you feel a little bit uncomfortably dirty. So if we put it on the, uh, the spectrum, where on the far left we've got very campy movies like Sharknado and Jason X, and on the far right we have very serious movies like The Silence of the Lambs. I have put this movie on the far right. I've shown it just a little to the left of Silence of the Lambs, and that's just because Art the Clown does seem to have some supernatural powers, and uh, because of that, that makes it, in a way, a slightly less serious movie than Silence of the Lambs because, you know, there is a little bit of, uh, of disbelief involved in that. And you can, you can say to yourself, oh, that can't really happen. But still, a very serious movie. Not the kind of movie that you have a bunch of people over to point and laugh at the TV. So there's the poster with the creepy close-up of Art the Clown. Let's do a quick film summary. This is a horror anthology, which means it is a collection of short films all of which revolve in some way around a demonic clown. The film is centered on a young woman who is babysitting a preteen brother and sister. And as the kids are going through their trick-or-treat candy, the brother discovers an old VHS tape that has been slipped into his bag of candy. And that is not at all creepy. After much whining and complaining, the sitter inexplicably allows the kids to watch the tape. And it's one of those things that, okay, on the one hand you're saying, what are you doing? And on the other hand, we've all kind of been there. Um, the kids are whining just to buy some peace. You let them do something that you know you probably shouldn't do. The film is a series of terrifying horror stories revolving around Art the Clown that start unveiling themselves on the TV as they watch this tape. After the first story, the sitter is horrified and sends the kids to bed. No more horror movies for you sends them to bed. But she's intrigued and continues watching the tape without them, even though it is clearly frightening her. As the tape goes on, the events in the film begin to intersect the real world and it just gets scary. So let's talk about the villain profile for this movie. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing this movie is that it is Halloween and it's time for Halloween themed movies, but also we wanted to talk about Art the Clown, who is one of the new iconic horror characters of the 21st century. He is right up there with Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger and the various ghost faces. Uh, he is just an iconic, terrifying character. He is of the class of murderous clowns, and I'm going to say apparently with supernatural powers. Let's talk about that. So as far as special powers go, it's unclear precisely what his powers are, but they appear to be supernatural with the ability to bend reality because he's able to just kind of get from one place to the next in ways that don't seem to conform with reality. Now, the thing is, this is an anthology movie. 
Uh, it's not a two-hour treatise on the history of Art the Clown, so they don't necessarily explain the origin of his powers or the limitations of them or, or exactly how they work, because he's just kind of a character that's here and there throughout the short films, but he does seem to have supernatural powers of some sort. Signature weapon, well, he uses a whole assortment of weapons, but he does seem to enjoy a good hacksaw. And as far as signature techniques go, he enjoys instumpinating his victims and then pantomiming laughter. And I say pantomiming laughter because, yes, Art the Clown does not speak. At no point in this movie does he speak. He is like a demonic mime, which makes him even scarier. So let's talk about the things Steve liked in this movie. It has an abundance of practical special effects. It has little concern for traditional horror movie taboos and rules, and it is not afraid to be shocking. It is dark, it is creepy, and the atmosphere is tainted with filth and disgust. Think of the original Saw. Now, like I said, this movie's not like Saw in terms of the subject matter. Uh, it's like Saw in terms of, you know, the feel of it. Just, just it's kind of dirty, and it's intentionally making you feel a little uncomfortable and a little disturbed. Art the Clown is just completely terrifying. And this is a seasonally appropriate choice for October viewing. We're counting down the days to Halloween here, and uh, this is just a really good movie to watch in the weeks leading up to Halloween. If you're the kind of person who can be frightened by a movie, this movie likely will frighten you at some point. Let's talk about some of the things that could have been better. Well, right off the bat, the acting is subpar, except for Art the Clown. The rest of the actors and actresses, uh, nobody's going to win any awards. The characters are flat and undeveloped, or at least underdeveloped, uh, so it makes it harder to feel anything for them. On the other hand, it's not so over the top, uh, making them unlikable, that you're just going to be rooting against them. So it, it, you're just kind of caught in the middle where you kind of want to root for the characters, but it's it's a little hard to care about them just because you, you don't have any feelings for them. The film is too dark visually, and when I say that, I don't mean it's too dark in terms of tone. I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean it literally. It feels like you're watching through a black piece of fabric. It's like somebody threw a pillowcase over your head and you're trying to watch the movie through that. Um, just too many dark filters. Uh, I know they were intentionally trying to make the movie look dark uh, to make it feel like one of those uh, video cassettes you would have rented from Blockbuster back in the day, but um, it, it just didn't work for me. I just found it a little too hard to see what was going on sometimes. Uh, maybe I'm just getting old. Casual fans may find the atmosphere a little too dark and creepy. Now this is not really a torture porn film, uh, but it does have a torture porn atmosphere and a bit of a torture porn feel and and, and uh, what I mean by that is that it's intentionally a little bit dirty a little bit distasteful if you think of the original Saul where they're trapped in kind of an abandoned bathroom and it just feels kind of filthy uh, a lot of the movie feels like that the film feels a bit like it was an excuse to do a showcase of practical special effects and that's because uh, that's probably true and many of the practical special effects are very good, but some of them are less than convincing, and, and that's just the way it goes when you do a, an effects showcase movie. Um, this movie is not a $200 million budget movie, so some of the practical special effects are very good. Some of them yeah, could have been better. So let's get to Steve's scorecard for All Hallows' Eve. Kills. Seven. Bare Breasts. I've had to give it a couple of asterisks. So you do have a woman who appears shirtless and squared up to the camera, but it is after she has spent some quality time with Art the Clown, and I'm just going to leave it at that. You'll just have to see exactly what that means. Car chases. There is a car chase. Instumpinatings. Oh, there are instumpinatings of plenty. I just said numerous. In parentheses, I've said seven plus. I started counting... Um, I counted at least seven, but the thing is, there's a lot of implied instumpinations where they don't really let you see everything, uh, but somebody has obviously had multiple limbs removed, but you only see one hand, so I literally counted seven. In reality, if you e extrapolate, there's going to be a lot more than seven. Dr. Huxtablings. 
There is one of those. Now, it's not as surreptitious as what the real Dr. Huxtable did. Uh, Art the Clown uses a, a syringe to try to um, take down somebody, but I am going to call it a Dr. Huxtabling. Double baggings. There is a double bagging in this movie. And annoying brats. There's not one, but two annoying brats in this movie. You also get some bonus features when you watch All Hallows Eve. You get Never Sniff the Creepy Clown's Flower. You get Demonic Sex Crimes. Yes, really. You get E.T.'s Naughty Cousin. Yes, really. Uh, you get a painting that's not quite as scary as that painting of the nun, but still pretty dang creepy. And finally, you get Pistol Packin' Art the Clown. I am not sure how I feel about movie killers in this kind of movie carrying a gun. And it's not like he uses it all the time, but he does use it once. So, uh, on the one hand, as somebody who grew up watching Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees, I'm rubbed the wrong way by seeing the uh, iconic villain using a gun. On the other hand, he only uses it once, so uh, maybe it's his Indiana Jones moment. Um, you be the judge. What's the final score for All Hallows' Eve? Well, Steve gives this two and a half paws out of four. It's an iconic cult favorite that evokes a lot of the creepy atmosphere of 80s slasher movies. It may be a bit too dark for casual fans, but it is a movie that every fan of horror should at least try at least once. Art the Clown is iconic. I'm not going to lie, this is not one of my favorite movies. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's just because it has kind of that torture porn, dark, creepy atmosphere to it, it's just not the kind of movie that I feel like I can watch over and over. But uh, I, I am glad I have seen the movie, and I will say it's a good movie. And if you are a fan of horror movies, I do recommend that you give it a try. So that's Steve's final score for All Hallows' Eve. And now a word from our delightful benefactors at PBDC TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. This is Mikey from Out of the Ordinary, and you're watching PBDC TV.
first thing in the morning when I'm listening to music and getting a little bit of time for some creepy research, I'm always representing with my PBDC merch. What a better way to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Don't forget to check out our other cool merch at RootsBleedRed.com. That's RootsBleedRed.com. This is Professor Redger Fluffosaurus from Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, and when I'm not hosting Monster Chat or knocking down small Japanese cities, I'm watching PBDC TV. Now back to the show. Our second featured film review for today is the film Terrifier. There's the poster, and once again, you see Art the Clown. This is a slasher film with torture porn ambiance, much like we talked about with All Hallows' Eve. Released in the year 2016, directed once again by Damien Leone, who directed All Hallows' Eve as well. And the cast includes Jenna Cannell, Samantha Scafidi, David Howard Thornton as Art the Clown, and Catherine Corcoran. Let's talk about setting your expectations for this film. What you should expect is a spin-off of All Hallows' Eve. This is a gory 80s throwback slasher film with some of the look and feel of a torture porn film. We talked about that in the previous film as well. It's not a torture porn film, but it kind of has the, uh, the ambiance or visual aroma of a torture porn film. You should watch this because it's an iconic modern horror film that every horror fan needs to see at least once. Now, I'm going to admit right up front, I do not care for Terrifier. Uh, I told you that I wasn't wild about All Hallows' Eve. I like Terrifier even less. I don't dislike the movie. I just think it's mediocre. Uh, but again, a lot of you seem to like it. And more to the point, it has become a modern, iconic film. So if you're a horror movie fan, you kind of need to watch this one once. And uh, I suspect many of you will like it. Um, I'm not crazy about it, but I think I'm in the minority on that one. You might like this film if you like All Hallows' Eve or Saw or Hatchet. And let's talk about calibrating your expectations a little bit. Now, when we talked about All Hallows' Eve, we said it was a very serious film and moved it very far to the right. And I was surprised that when I went and put together the review for this film, I put Terrifier on the left side of the spectrum. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, in my opinion, Terrifier just is very, very, very poorly written. There is too much suspension of disbelief, and it just made it too difficult for me to take this movie seriously, so I had to move it over towards the campy side of things. And also, it felt very much like a an excuse to do a, hey, look what Art's going to do to this guy. Now, hey, look what Art's going to do to this guy. Hey, look what he's going to do to this woman. And it just it felt like an excuse to do one special effect after another after another, while people played drinking games and, and said, like, dude, that's awesome. So I um, can't put that on the very serious side of the spectrum. You may disagree. Um, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Let's do a film summary of Terrifier. This is a gory slasher film meant to be reminiscent of 80s slasher films, but also has a bit of a torture porn atmosphere. And we talked about that with All Hallows' Eve. This is not a direct sequel to All Hallows' Eve because, you know, All Hallows' Eve was, a, was an anthology, so you can't really necessarily have a direct sequel, but it is a spin-off. It is a full-length film just about one story involving Art the Clown and some of his victims. In this film, college students Tara and Dawn have left a Halloween costume party and are ready to head home, but they decide that they are too buzzed from the party to drive. Smart decision because they were too buzzed to drive. They head to a nearby pizza shop to have some food and sober up enough to drive. While at the pizza shop, they encounter a gross, creepy man in a clown costume who never speaks, but is creepily fixated upon Tara. And, of course, we know that that is Art the Clown. They don't know that, but we know that. As Tara and Dawn return to the car, they see that one of the tires has been slashed and they have no spare tire. So Tara calls her sister Victoria, who is also a college student who, of course, is home studying for exams, and convinces Victoria to drive into town to give them a ride home. And while Tara and Dawn wait for Victoria to arrive, Art the Clown begins a bloody rampage, and many, many deaths occur. 
let's talk about things Steve liked about this film. Much like All Hallows' Eve, this has a dark, creepy atmosphere uh, of kind of a filthy ambiance. Uh, again, kind of a visual aroma that you would get with uh, one of the Saw films. Art the Clown is creepily terrifying. I don't think he's nearly as terrifying in this film as he was in the other film. He, he is played by a different actor in Terrifier than he was in All Hallows' Eve, and I don't know how much that had to do with it. Uh, just, I haven't watched the two films back to back to see if you can really tell that it's not the same guy. But, um, Art the Clown, he's creepy, and, uh, the fact that he never speaks makes him even more terrifying. I just don't find him quite as terrifying in this film as in All Hallows' Eve. This film, like the other one, has lots of practical special effects and avoids the use of digital special effects, which we are big fans of, so we love our practical special effects here at Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. And you get a surprisingly good performance by Jenna Cannell as Tara. She gives a what I'd consider a surprising amount of depth and likability to what easily could have been a one-dimensional character. And there she is. I found her very likable. Uh, I really was rooting for her in this film. She, uh, I, I thought, overachieved relative to the, uh, the other caliber of actors who were in this film and just the overall budget of the film. Things that could have been better, right off the bat, the acting is mediocre except for Jenna Cannell, and this time around I would even say Art the Clown is mediocre. Art the Clown, not as terrifying this time around. He's more annoying. Now, not annoying from beginning to end, but some of the things that he does that I guess are supposed to be kind of scary, I just kind of rolled my eyes and I just wanted them to be over. Like All Hallows' Eve, this film is too dark visually, and I don't mean too dark in terms of tone or emotion. I mean too dark in terms of I can't see what's going on. It feels like somebody put a pillowcase over my head and I'm trying to watch through the fabric. Once again, casual fans may find the atmosphere a little too dark and creepy with a torture porn ambiance. Um, this one, you know, if you're, a new, if you're a new horror fan and you know going in that it's going to be a gory film, certainly give it a try. Uh, it would not surprise me if somebody who did not grow up watching uh, classic 80s slasher films could not really get into this one. Some of the practical, practical special effects are less than convincing. That's kind of uh, what you get with these practical special effects uh, showcases. The film tries to be suspenseful at times, but it just didn't work for me, and I can't really put my finger on why, but this film, more than building suspense, it just annoyed me, and I, was, I just found myself like tapping my foot saying, okay, can we get, get this over with, please? The writing of this film is embarrassing. The suspension of disbelief and implausible character decisions that are part of any slasher film, um, in this film, you're just asked to swallow way too much of it. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I just, um, I, I, I can't excuse the writing in this film. I, I know you don't go see a slasher film for good writing, but you, you gotta show a little bit of respect for the audience, and to me, the writing of this film did not show some respect for the audience. And once again, Art the Clown pulls out a gun, which uh, I was willing to swallow it once as an Indiana Jones moment, but I'm really unhappy with it in this film. So let's go to Steve's scorecard for Terrifier. Kills, 10. Bare breasts, 4. And two of those are actually a special effects shot. Dean Nogginings, 2. Possumings, 1. Instubinatings, one. Tangerinings, one partial. Stomp noodlings, oh yeah, there's a stomp noodling in this one for sure with big, clop, big floppy clown shoes. Dr. Huxtablings, once again there is one, although it is perpetrated with a syringe, not slipping something into somebody's drink. Double baggings, once again there is a double bagging in this film. And Long Division, and this is what the film is most famous for. I am not going to give away the spoiler in case you haven't seen it, but the one iconic moment of this film involves a case of Long Division. Yes, there is a very famous case of double dutching or going half seas in this film. So let's talk about some bonus features for Terrifier. You get bitchy TV news personalities. Uh, that, will, that will not end well for her, and you'll be happy about it. 
You get use of car radio to provide exposition twice, and it's just, it's embarrassing. It just hurts to watch. It is just so obviously, this is what you need to know as the audience, so we're going to have this pop up on the car radio. It just, it's painful. You get face brunching, which I'm sure that was painful too. You get, there's never a cop when you need one, and this is what I talked about with the embarrassing bad writing in this film, okay? So I understand that it's low budget, and I understand that you don't want to pay a bunch of actors in police costumes to pretend to be cops, but for God's sake, you've got people in the car within walking distance of this pizza place hearing a news report that there's been a double murder and that the suspect is still on the loose and authorities think he may have doubled back and these two girls are literally a block away from this and yet there's no cop in sight. You hear one siren off in the distance and it just makes no sense. You get selective teleportation because these girls are walking back to their car from a party and then the pizza parlor is within walking distance and yet later in the film they act as if they are stranded with nowhere to go and it's like you were at a party within walking distance of this. Why didn't you just walk back to there? Why didn't you walk back to the pizza parlor where, coincidentally, a bunch of police should have been? It's just, it's nonsense. You get, this is a morgue, really. We didn't just rent a basement storage room from the local church to shoot this scene. It's really a morgue. Uh, yeah, the final scene of this that is supposed to take place in a morgue uh, is very clearly not a morgue. It is very clearly the basement of probably a local church. And you get Pistol Pack and Art the Clown. Now, in All Hallows' Eve, Pistol Pack and Art the Clown pulled out his pistol and fired one round during a car chase. And I was kind of okay with that as kind of a once-off Indiana Jones moment. In this film, he starts losing in a confrontation with one of his victims. And so he pulls out a Model 1911 and starts firing and wounds the victim and then runs out of ammunition and then goes off and reloads and comes back and empties the clip into the victim and it's just for god's sake it's awful i'm sorry i grew up watching michael myers and jason Voorhees. no 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 this is not what the psychotic killers in slasher movies are supposed to do i was able to swallow it once as kind of a indiana jones kind of reference but uh, no I, I was just as a horror fan, this offended me. So let's go to Steve's final score for Terrifier. I'm going to give it two paws out of four. I know a lot of you love this film, and if you saw the poster in the earlier slides, you saw a lot of four stars on there. I know I'm in the minority on this one. My feeling is that Art the Clown may be an iconic character, but this film is uninspiring, predictable, and relies too heavily upon implausible scenarios. It's a decent film, I personally believe it is overrated. I know a lot of people love this film who are horror fans, but frankly, having listened to them, I think they're of that school that they love this film because they love to sit back and say, oh, dude, look what he's going to do here. Oh, now look what he's going to do here. Oh, watch this. This is cool. It's not that they really love it as a film. Uh, they they, they kind of love it uh, in the way that you love a film that's to the far left of our spectrum that's very campy and you play drinking games while you enjoy um, not a bad film, not a great film. Like I said, it has become kind of a modern horror classic, so if you are a horror movie fan, you really do need this one to be one of the arrows in your quiver, so you need to watch this one at least once. Um, honestly, most of you will probably like it more than I did. I, I, I know I'm in the minority on this one, but uh, that's our review for Terrifier. Before we sign off for this week, let's take just a couple of minutes to talk about some other stuff Steve watched this week. Number one, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. In this film, an up-and-coming slasher gives a documentary film crew behind-the-scenes access to his life as he plans his masterpiece. Now, this is a horror comedy that plays on the classic rules of slasher films, and this is an excellent movie. I absolutely recommend this film. I've watched it several times. can absolutely recommend this one. It's a good one. Number two, The Monster Project. Amateur filmmaker Devin assembles a crew to interview people who claim to be actual monsters, such as skinwalkers and vampires. Things turn deadly as the crew find themselves trapped in an abandoned house with a group of all too real monsters. Now this is a found footage film and it's a decent found footage horror movie. I would recommend this one if you're a fan of found footage films. Now 
It suffers from the same problem that so many, you know, low to moderate budget found footage films have, that there's just, there seems to be a, a lot of development and just all the action at the end. But this one's pretty good. Uh, as found footage movies go, this one's pretty good. I would recommend it if you're into that sort of thing. Number three, Ghoul Catchers. A group of four friends, now in their late 20s, have been hunting ghouls together for fun since they were 12 years old. This is an extremely low budget comedy. I don't even know that you can call this a horror comedy. I think it's more just a comedy. Um, I hated this one. I do not recommend it. Uh, however, some reviewers do seem to think it's funny. Now, many of those reviewers do cop to the fact that they were drunk at the time. So take that with a grain of salt. I absolutely cannot recommend this movie, but um, I'm not going to say nobody has ever liked it. So, you know, take take a look at it online and uh, make make a decision for yourself but if you invest any time in this and turn out to hate it you can't say you weren't warned anyway so uh, to summarize definitely recommend behind the mask rides of Leslie Vernon recommend the monster project if you like found footage horror movies uh, recommend you stay away from ghoul catchers unless you're drunk and even then you can probably find better things to do with your time so that's other stuff Steve watched this week well, that brings us to the end of our latest Halloween-themed episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you did enjoy the show, please remember to like, share, subscribe, and follow. You can find us on Facebook at Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. And yes, that's Tales with an A-I-L-S. Also, please remember to check out all of my friends and their great programming on PBDC-TV. Whether you're interested in horror, true crime, weird history, or unexplained events, we're sure to have something for you. And don't worry, if you're not familiar with PBDC-TV, it's very easy to find. We're on the World Wide Web at pbdctv.com, and we're on YouTube at PsychoBunnyDC. We've also got a large presence on Facebook. You can find The Mothership at PBDC-TV, or you can go directly to dedicated pages for PsychoBunny Death Cult, Psychomandium 13, and Roots Bleed Red. Each channel has a slightly different atmosphere, but they're all a part of the PBDC TV Broadcast Collective. Well, October may be at an end, but there are still plenty of horror movies to come this season on Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Next week, we'll be reviewing a couple of sci-fi horror films, so we hope to see you then. In the meantime, thank you once again for joining us. Everyone stay safe and have a great week. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody.